Isn't Jesus amazing? I want you to stand for a moment. I want you to act like your foot is on the devil's neck. Right now, think about what he's done to your finances, your family, the lies that he said to you, times he tormented you in the night. The Bible says that we're going to bruise his head. So you got to take one of your feet right now and just squeeze down on the floor and it's on the devil's neck. And you say, devil, you're a liar. You are defeated. Everything you said is a lie. Only God's word is real. And I believe it. Now, some of you are giving me that uh, Tri-Cities look. You're skeptical. You wonder if there's a lot of dramatization going on. I did not begin praying for the sick in some, some abandoned area in the middle of rural America where everyone maybe is detached from the city. I began at the University of California at Berkeley among the less than 1% elite of all students in the U.S., you have to have a 4.0 to apply at Berkeley. And then, as uh, David Hogg found out, you don't get in even with a 4.0. That intellectual environment could not be broken by any debate. There's a notion here in the Tri-Cities that intellect, education, and technology are the answer. And certainly if a minister hopes to succeed in this region, they've got to doctor the gospel up to a certain intellectual presentation. Well, Paul went through that debate. When he was at Athens and he preached on Mars Hill, he gave the most amazing defense of the gospel. Any professor would have been in awe of it. In fact, if you study debate, it is called one of the greatest rebuttals of debate, and it's actually studied. The Mars Hill sermon is studied in debate. But on his way to Corinth, there was no lasting result in Athens. Mm -hmm. We don't even have a record that a church was established. And on the walk from Athens to Corinth, Paul made up his mind. And he said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to leave the overemphasis on debate out of my preaching Mm -hmm. and I'm going to operate in signs, wonders, and miracles. Now here's the problem with the video you just saw of Heidi Baker. And we'll be seated in a moment. I know you're standing, but I've got a reason for having you stand just for a moment. Is that we say, well, the poor and the ignorant in Africa are more susceptible to miracles. That's not in the Bible. Somebody was smoking something and made that up. (laughs) And unfortunately, we believe it. But it is absolutely not true. At Berkeley, God hammered one thing into me. Every Saturday night, you have to lay hands on the sick. And when they're healed, the students will get saved. We ended up with a student fellowship of 2,000. And Berkeley has never seen anything approaching that. In over a hundred years. Now, let me ask you something. What happened to Paul when he got to Corinth? He said, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of man's wisdom. Mm -hmm. He could have, but he chose not to. Mm -hmm. Is it because Corinth had an inferior educational system to Athens? Absolutely not. He knew it was at the same level. He knew it was at the same level of curiosity and intelligence. And I'm telling you, the demons in the Tri-Cities, they have no power against the blood of Christ. Come on, somebody. They have no power. So, uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, I want to be with you in order that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Put your hand over your heart. You're here to receive something from God. You're here to receive something from God. The first thing with your eyes closed you're going to receive 
is you're going to decide today to stop putting up with demonic activity. Stop putting up with the attack on your money. Stop putting up with sickness in your body. You've got better things to do than to worry. Now, I want you to admit that in your soul. I've got more important things to do than to worry and to surmise and to imagine. When the Bible talks about vain imaginations, it is speaking about thoughts that we allow to take root in our mind that take over our faith and our ability to believe that God is operating and at work in our career, in our children, in our marriage, and in our life. Now, here's the hard part. And it's real hard. We've got to quit blaming God for the results of our own negligence. We've got to quit praying, saying, God, why did you let that happen? We let it happen. We tolerated it. We let it take root in our life and in our family and our children. So we speak this word right now. I have the victory in Christ. And I'm overcoming... To be a blessing to others. I'm overcoming my illness, my poverty, my fear, so that I am more dangerous for those that need God. Now clap your hands if you believe what you just said. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to be seated right now. How many of you are glad you're here today? I'm going to get right down to it. I'd like you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 14. And I'm going to give you the second point of my sermon. Now that I've given you the first. And it's, uh, we're going to begin reading in the 16th verse of Luke chapter 14. And I wonder if I could get an empty chair put up here on the stage. Just put a folding chair right here for a minute. This is my prop. I'm not going to sit in it. I want you to look at it in a minute. In Luke 14, verse 16, it said, Then he said, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Verse 17 said, He sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are ready. But they, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excuse. Another said, and thank God I come with my own money. (laughs) And I must go and see it. And I'm going to test them. And I ask you to have me excuse still another verse 20. He said, I married a wife. I don't know why he didn't just bring his wife. (laughs) And therefore cannot come. So that the servant came and reported those things to his master. Then the master of the house being angry. Everybody said being being angry. Said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. And bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you've commanded, and there's still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways, byways, and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Every one of you have sat in a chair. You're sitting in a pew. Have you ever thought about what the most powerful piece of furniture in the world is? Now, we could say a Louis XV chair. Some of them are worth over a million dollars. We could say that one of those stone seats that were found in uh, King Tut's tomb, pretty priceless. Or we can talk about a hospital bed and a psychiatrist's couch. But there is no piece of furniture in the world like a chair inside of a church. Because you look at this and you say to yourself, what could happen to me if I laid down on a psychiatrist's couch? I'm going to get human advice. Let me give you some advice. 
You don't want to pay $200 an hour for somebody that might be crazier than you are. Now, how many of you would rather be in that pew than in a hospital bed? Well, there's concert seats. There's chairs in universities. But you say to me, Mara, how can we change the Tri-Cities? How can we alter this place, really? The Bible says something really amazing. It says a man gave a great feast. You know who, who, what you got to do to measure that? How great was it? How great was that feast? You know how great it was? It was Jesus who said it was great. If I say it was great, that is limited to whatever cuisine I've had in my lifetime. But he came from glory. How many of you know they can put on a meal up there? And I know it's going to be Mexican food. I do. No, I, I just, glory to God. Glory a Dios. So one day I was starving in college. How many of you know that's almost a redundant statement? <laughs> and I had left San Francisco to go up north to the Bay, from the Bay Area to go to college in a little college in Reading. Bethel Church is up there, but it was, it was Shasta College. So I decided the only way I'd ever study is to get away from everybody I knew. But I was 100 miles from Mexican food. And that's killer. I had to survive on food and water. And you have to understand that my mother makes a chili relleno that will give you a vision of God. And for those of you that are culturally deprived, I want to tell you, when mama makes flour tortillas by hand. And that aroma fills the whole house. She puts it in a basket and covers it with a cloth. And when you roll up a handmade flour tortilla, it's a lot thicker than that paper thin garbage they sell you at Whole Foods. You put butter on that and you, you're going to be in the third heaven. Amen. Amen. Now, this is way back in the day. In the year 19, none of your business. I'm in college. I haven't had one of my mama's food. And uh, one day my friend says to me in the local dialect, today we're going to have ethnic food. And I say, what do you mean? They've opened a Mexican restaurant. I knelt down. My hands went up to heaven. I look at what they thought was a Mexican restaurant. This is back in the days of affirmative action. I look at it and it says Taco Bell. <laughs> and brother, I thought that we Latinos had finally had our own telephone company. <laughs> now that's funny. I don't care who you are. But you see, they bought me one. And I put that alleged taco, listen, a genuine Latino palate, they put a Taco Bell taco inside of that. My tongue jumped straight up to the roof of my mouth, ran to the back, cut off my air supply, and said, if you don't spit this out, I'm going to choke you to death. <laughs> now watch me. The next moment was revelation. My college mates thought this was Mexican food. I began to cry. Tears. I said, no, you're deceived. The spirit of Antichrist is on you. You have no idea how much, gar this is cardboard right here. This is mystery meat right here. You have no idea what you're saying. And that's exactly what happens on campus with Christianity. Now, I just made a good point. You know, I work hard for that, brother. Don't you think they ought to have made more noise? Somebody ought to have done more. Am I right? 
a certain man gave a great feast. For Jesus to say that, how many of you know this had to be the best food in the world? It had to be the best setting in the world. And then he said, people were invited and they said no. Now I hope there's an atheist in the room. I do. I love you. I understand. You're probably being very intellectually honest in your mind. But I'm going to tell you something. The owner of the banquet got angry. You know what we believe? We believe that pastors should never get angry. Pastor, you should never get mad. I left the church because the pastor got mad. How many of you know you're an idiot? <laughs> At what they thought was better than the gospel. Really? The insanity of the American culture is twofold. Number one, look at what intellectuals in the United States believe is better than the gospel of Christ. And you cannot do that without dishonesty. And you cannot do that without obfuscation. You cannot do that unless you deny history. You cannot reject the message of Christ. Jesus said the most delicious food in the philosophical American arena is the word of God. There is nothing that produces more equality, more love. If you want to get rid of misogyny, if you want to get rid of bigotry, if you want to get rid of injustice, you don't go to Islam. You don't go to Buddha. You don't go to intellectualism. You go to the New Testament. And for you to feel anger over that remark, and I think I'm back in business here. The electronic lungs have kicked in. <laughs> it is one thing for a professor at our local college to sit up there and pontificate about what's truth. He's a bully. He's got young minds that need a grade. So he'll say whatever he thinks is right. He'll talk about how evil America is. He'll talk about how everything is a certain group's fault. He'll never base it in reality. He bases it on reaction. You're born male. You're born female. And when you stop talking about that, you're leaving science behind. And the leftists in America have left science behind. They've said to science, we don't want you anymore. When you no longer fit the narrative, we're not going to talk about biology. When you no longer fit our agenda of how we were trying to change America, we're not going to talk about science anymore. Then they'll take us and bend truth and make us the villains of things we have never done, never said, and never believed. Now, here's what the man was angry about. He was angry at those who he had invited. I invited you to receive Christ. You decided to become a communist. You're so open-minded, your brains have fallen out. I invited you to serve God by the power of the word of God. And you think that an open marriage, sexual experimentation is going to lead you to some enlightened state. When did that ever happen? Come on. When in history did that ever happen? Come on. I'm going to enforce a law that confiscates your property and gives it to people that don't even want to work. Because that's justice. Nobody has ever been able to build scaffolding around the human heart that forced it to be virtuous. Wow. No one has ever built a system of government that somehow by enacting a law made them overnight fair and just. Right. Yeah. Justice, sharing, equality come from the heart. Yeah. Come you have to change the heart. Yeah. Help me somebody. Oh. You have to change the heart. The service to the poor should never have been the job of government. Government stepped in and stole compassion out of the church. The best sharing, the best charity, the best giving, the best, you see it on the screen. Everywhere Christianity goes, everywhere the Christ message is practiced with unbiased vigor. Come on. Come on. 
the poor are wiped out and fed and taken care of and given something even more important, a will to live, a will to advance, a will to make something of their life. You know, let me tell you, the left want to guarantee an outcome for every American. They want to fabricate a world in which your money is confiscated to guarantee an outcome, but it is based on a fantasy that's worse than anything Dorothy had in the land of Oz. <laughs> Goodness does not immediately occur. Sharing is not enforceable. You can definitely create a law, but you're going to create it resentment. Yeah. And we're going to resent the poor. And Jesus said to love the poor. Mm -hmm. But you're going to create a resentment. So now let's get back. Here's the gospel. The problem with the world is they don't understand how wrong they are to think this is better than serving Jesus. This is better than serving God. We need to legalize marijuana because maybe if I'm stoned, I'm really going to get somewhere. And where have you gotten? Come on. You lost IQ points in the search of intelligence. Your open marriage destroyed the covenant you had with your partner. Now you're with a complete stranger and they're figuring out that you're the jerk you were with the last partner. None of this has worked. And here's the problem. Look at me. Look at me. Accountability, ladies and gentlemen. The crime is increased. The hatred is increased. The poverty is increased. We've thrown a trillion dollars into Detroit and it looks like Nagasaki in 1945. Because we forgot God. We forgot virtue. We forgot that whatever truth America needs now has got to make the sinner repent before God. Yeah. Somebody help me right now. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the master said he got angry. Why? How can they think their oxen, their date night, their real estate holdings can be anything compared to the atmosphere of the feast. Let's talk about church. What should church be like? Church should be the most exciting event in a city. No concert, no sporting event can compare to a meeting where a teenager stops wanting to commit suicide where a family that's about to divorce is re, uh, redeemed, Come on. Come on. where the wife beater turns into a model husband, where the addict is set free, not in 12 steps, but in one. Come on. Come on. Somebody give God the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he got mad. We need to get mad. Yeah. And you know who we need to get mad at? Keep smiling. I'm talking to every pastor in America right now because I understand this is going out on the net. On. Someone said, Mara, we're going to live stream. My first thought, I better be careful what I said. Then it suddenly hit me. I better say everything I can if it's going out on the net. Yeah. Mara, you're a hater. Yep, sure do. Sure am. I'm a black belt in hating. I hate the devil. I hate crystal meth. I hate perversion. I hate slavery. I hate racism and poverty. And I hate it with a perfect hatred. Now, if I'm guilty of hating, that's what I hate. And I hate leaders that keep foisting onto the young American mind things that don't work and have never worked and will never work. Now, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> now, now, let's talk. Why should we be mad? Why should this man of God be angry? Why should every pastor be angry? We will not change America by force feeding them a deluded gospel. We have got to be reintroduced to our own reason for existence. We got to come back to the foot of the cross and start all over again and say, 
I have a right to be at the table of American influence. I ought to be in every conversation when some harebrained idiot decides that policy should come to oppress the freedom of speech and the equality of Americans. Oh, that's not spiritual. We don't belong there. That's exactly why we're here. It's like asking a Christian doctor not to heal the sick. It's to ask a civic-minded Christian not to bring into the debate the power of virtue in the American establishment. Now, we don't have enough American history. And the ones that teach it, teach it like cold bean soup. America's a miracle. Warts and all, slavery and all, everything that the founding fathers did wrong does not negate. That's why I love the book of Romans chapter 3, verse 1. It said, so what if some did not believe? Does that make faith in God without power? So you say, well, there have been hypocrites. Yeah, so if your dentist is a hypocrite, you're going to stop brushing your teeth? The Declaration of Independence, a miracle. The American Constitution, a miracle. The miracle is that God on this continent produced a system of rewarding hard work with results that the human race had never seen before. So now we want to be like Europe. Go over there for a while. See all the dead and empty churches. See how an entire youth generation has turned their back on God all across Europe. Honoring ideas that led them into nihilistic, cynical, dark, and foreboding corridors of thinking. Now, the master said, I'm mad. And we got to get mad at ourselves. We got to get mad at ourselves. And today, I'm yanking you out of the Christian Witness Protection Program. This clearing your throat by the water cool. <clears throat> I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you Christians, and then some clown sits there and just backs up like an open sewer talking about stuff that he cannot substantiate about the Bible and the Word of God and the role of the Christian faith in American government. Is anybody with me on this right now? All right, now. So he called his staff together. The master of the house called his staff together and said, today I'm redefining all your job descriptions. So you used to polish my silverware, but I'm changing your job. You made my pastry. You're my pastry chef. I'm changing your job. You used to trim my topiaries. I'm going to give you a new job. You're no longer a gardener. You're no longer a chauffeur. You're no longer doing this, that. You know what you are today? You are a weapon in the hand of God. Yeah. And you're going to go out. And, and you're going to go out. And you're going to tell the poor and the lame and the willing. We are not here to take some bulbous gas bag intellectual and talk him into Christ. Let's go and get the hungry. Let's go and get the marginalized and the forgotten. Let's go get those that haven't even entered that arena of debate. This other brother with the false intellect and the atheism, he needs to saute for a while. He needs to leave the safe confines of his lecture hall and collide with real life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Actually, what I believe is they should be forced by federal law to go work for a summer in a ranch in Montana. By August, reality will set in and Bernie Sanders will be a thing of the past. I'm going to give you all free stuff. Now, I'm angry. There's no philosophy that stands before Christ. That's why the Bible said this. Paul, having this exact mood that I'm in, said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds and bringing every thought 
that is disobedient to Christ in the captivity. We don't force people to be Christians, but we can tear down demonic lies. That's right. Somebody say amen. You are no longer my gardener, my cook, my driver, my domestic. You are now a weapon in the hand of God, and I'm sending you out. Every pastor in the Tri-Cities needs to do that to their staff. You need to have a private staff meeting. Every pastor who's listening to me needs to revoke their entire priority list. I look at the walls of this church. Found people, find people. You can't live, do life alone. Save people, serve people. You know what they're doing here? They're destroying the ability of the inactive member to be a part of this church. You can't walk in here and say, I found a safe zone and I'm being handed a Pentecostal teddy bear to hug. And whenever danger and the approach of danger, the pastor will remind me how much God loves me unconditionally and has forgiven me for things I haven't even done yet. So we get this teaching that's like paralysis. It can affect you like, like the poison dart from a Brazilian Indian tribe where all of a sudden you can't move your arms and your legs because somebody taught you about grace. Grace that made you realize you don't have to do anything. You can do anything you want, except you can't move. You have power over nothing, and you're entitled to everything. You know, and then they take, and they call that grace. They said, you know what? God has not only forgiven you of what you've done, but what you're going to do in the future and you offend God when you repent and apologize to him. Once again, marijuana. <laughs> You're not helping me enough. I'm working hard. Yeah. Yeah. You never have to apologize. Try that in your marriage. Husband comes home and he looks at his wife and he says, I demand my rights as a husband. You're not only going to get rights, you're going to get lefts. <laughs> rights and lefts. So then they take 1 John and they give it a hernia. They said that verse that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. They said that wasn't written to Christians. Well, who wrote the book? John. And he said, if we. So you, in order for you to say that that wasn't for Christians, you have to say that the apostle John wasn't a Christian. Because it said, if we confess our sin, that means you and me, the apostle. Then he is faithful and just to forgive you know what? The Christian life is a constant state of repentance. It's a constant state of soul searching and admitting to God our failure and growing. And, and if you're not doing that regularly, you're already floating into deception. Now, we have got to get back to the glorious power of the gospel. The gospel is the most powerful thing that ever happened in the Tri-Cities. We got something that works. We got something that the doctor, the psychiatrist, the professor all need to know. That Jesus is real and that you don't check your brain at the door when you become a Christian. How can you think that you're going to lose your intellectual prowess by interacting with the inventor of the human brain? Man, where did that come from? Okay. That, we're not charging any extra for that. <laughs> we need to remember America is a miracle. We need to restore the values that made us great. We need to remember that the Bible is not just some book that you can target and say it's all filled with inconsistencies. Are you kidding me? You're going to attack the Bible? When Voltaire, the great intellectual of Europe, was facing death, he was about to die, he became ill, and out of anger and, and rancor, he said, 50, 
50 years after I'm dead, there won't be a Bible in Europe, not one. He had his own printing presses where he printed all of his anti-God stuff. And he said right before he died, there won't be a, a Bible in Europe 50 years after I die. So 50 years after he died, the Geneva Bible Society bought his house and his printing presses. I'm, I'm going over here with this. So I'm, yeah. No book has ever faced more scrutiny. Nobody has ever hated the Bible more than Satan. He has raised up in every generation a despot, a pseudo-intellectual, an anti-Bible expert to go in there and try to find a fallacy and disprove it. And 2,000 years later, there's more faith in the Word of God in the earth than there ever has been before. Somebody give God the glory. Hallelujah. Go! I actually heard a preacher say that the Great Commission isn't uh, applicable today. And I said, what part of go don't you understand? <laughs> go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's no doubt, there's no biblical theologian worth their salt that doesn't know that that portion of Luke 14 applied to the Great Commission. Yeah. Go. Go and get the people. You don't have time, and I don't have time. You know, one time, there was a Christian from the Tri-Cities that got trapped on a desert island, charismatic from the Tri-Cities, found on a desert island and he'd built three huts. And the rescuer said, what is this hut? He said, well, that's where I sleep. He said, where's the second hut? Well, that's where I go to church. He said, what's his third hut? He said, well, that's where I used to go to church. And when we became inbred and instead of winning the loss, we began to build churches based on moving Christians from other churches. We created this inability to tolerate accountability in Christians and we lost power. Now, here's where we get what we need is to re-embrace the glory of the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Put your hand over your heart. It is the answer. It is the answer. Say it out loud. It is the to every social ill, to every, social to every question of the human heart, to every problem, to every problem in society. Problem. And I am, not ashamed. I, am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed, am not ashamed. of the gospel of Christ. Mara, why isn't anyone preaching this? Why does every pastor on TV sound like a car dealer at midnight? <laughs> they got the toothy grin, the breathy voice, the apologetic tone, because they harbor an inner inability to have confidence in the gospel. They have gone over to Anthony Robbins. They have borrowed from Oprah. They've been titillated by new age because secretly they harbor this conviction. The gospel is not enough for the modern mind. And no one has ever substantiated that. Do you know this battle is waged in every generation? Every generation has to redecide whether the gospel is valid to their new time. Every generation, the devil belches out some deception that's new. And every generation, heaven creates a weapon that will answer that. That's why the Bible says the anointing will break the yoke. In every generation. I'm almost done. They came back. And they said, we've done what you said, but there's still room in the banquet hall. 
You hear of pastors that are totally addicted by church growth. That's all they care about. They will not preach anything that could cost them a member. They will cart you over to the, your seat. They will carry you. They will tell you to turn on your headlights so you get valet parking. <laughs> They'll do everything to make it convenient for you. Here's the problem. They're doing it out of a saying, look at me. The Bible does not apply to everything going on today. The power of the Holy Spirit is not enough to change a modern mind. God is not the one building this church I am. Now, that's one extreme. But there's another extreme. And I'm going to tell you, this other extreme is what created this extreme. And that's the extreme of a pastor that stands up and boldly announces to his audience, we are not into entertainment here. You come to our church, you're going to live right, be right, and if you don't like it, get out. Whenever you say get out to a congregation, they get out. <laughs> and they're small. We're small. We may be small, but we're holy. <laughs> we're holy small. <laughs> we're He said, and I'm proud to announce that as your pastor, our attendance is dropping slower than it ever has before. Somehow we've almost stopped the bleeding. And then he'll say, we are not into entertainment. You look up the word entertainment and it says to hold an audience's attention. They don't know how not into entertainment they really are. Because nobody's listening to them. We're not to be cultural reactionaries. We're not to sit there and say, everybody's wrong and I'm right. We don't want to appeal to that stereotype that the left loves of the bigoted, narrow-minded, reactionary, unthinking Christian. It says, you know what? Don't confuse me with facts. I know what I think. Well, you don't think. Last thought you had was at the homecoming five years ago over the punch bowl. Now, there is the extreme of the small church that wants to be small and the big church that wants to be big at any cost. This one says, we need a giant church. And this one said, we don't need a giant church. We need spiritual giants. And here's what Jesus wants. A giant church filled with spiritual giants. <laughs> I want you to help me out of way. They're recording this, so I want this to look like a dramatic moment <laughs> where someone did a sound bite. You know how they pull a preacher's preaching and they get, let's, let's build a sound bite. Get ready to oh, amen God real loud, all right? Everybody ready? Inhale and act. I mean, explode and make sure we videotape this and edit all of this lead up out. We're going to have a YouTube moment right now. Come on. They are wrong to say that they want a church that is small and filled with giants. They are wrong to say that they want a giant church. What Jesus wants is a giant church filled with giants. I feel convicted now. <laughs> See, this guy in the small church, the 30-fold uh, guy, he looks at empty seats and he's okay with them. And you need to understand what you just read is when he heard there were still seats available, the leader of the banquet said, go out again, that my house may be full. Now, I'm, I'm going to get back to this chair. In a church chair, unlike a psychiatrist's couch, God will give you a spirit, not of fear, but of love, power, and a sound Amen. mind. Come on. Come on. Right. In a church, 
in a church, God will heal your body. It's better than a hospital bed. God doesn't care if you have medical coverage or not. Most importantly, he has benefits. And the Bible says, forget not all his benefits. Don't look at your blue cross and read the small print of things they're not going to do for you and the money you have to pay for the things they don't do. Forget not all his benefits. Get ready for another loud amen. And Jesus doesn't care if you had a pre-existing condition. Yeah. So Jesus taught, told him, the man gave a great feast and they went out and there were still seats available. In an epidemic, should there be an empty hospital bed? No. As long as there's a bed, we need to get someone else in it. When the ship is sinking, if there are empty seats in the lifeboat, they didn't do it on the Titanic, but they should have. You listen to the screaming, you turn your boat around. We've got three seats here. We've got to change from this obsession of church growth into being an army that is overcome with the compassion and the love of God. That someone could have been sitting there this morning instead of sitting on the edge of town about to put a gun in their mouth. We are the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. It's up to us to break the shame barrier. Let's break it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to everyone who believes. So in closing, see, I closed my notes to give you the false sense that I can't say much more because you're sitting there going, he, his notes, he, did, he can't even look at him now. He's got to stop. He hadn't memorized anything. If you have a child, they have to see you believing for your finances. Because you don't want to leave them money. You want to leave them the conviction that God will provide for them. That's the inheritance of the righteous. Your children need to see you pushing back on evil. Sir, your son needs to watch you tell the devil to stay out of your house. Because you're going to leave them the legacy of authority over evil. They need to watch you love people that, you, that hate you. They need to watch you use your faith to stand in the hour of fear. We're giving our children everything they don't need and nothing they do need. Now, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine Jesus as the head of the feast. And you're in the church and Jesus has just said to you, I'm angry. I'm angry at what the American culture thinks is better than Christianity. I'm angry that the microphone is being controlled by the bottom of society. I don't mean the poor. I'm not talking about socioeconomic level. When I refer to the bottom of the society is when the greedy, the corrupted, the filthy, the vile, and the obsessed have the power to speak to a generation because the church is paralyzed with a false sense of inferiority and doesn't speak out. The minute you admit that you are a soldier, that there's no spectators in the Christian movement, there's no watchers, there's no, nobody on the bench, everybody is chosen by God to do something miraculous, to do something supernatural, to live a life outside of their own realm 
of concern. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Start praying in the Holy Spirit, everyone. Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit. Even louder. Even louder. Bring that volume up some more on you, on your prayer. And flood this house with the presence and the power of God. Come on. Let it be. Let it be. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Miracles. Power. And the flow of Jesus. Now, I wonder, is it, is it okay if I step down here, Pastor? Whenever I'm in an audience like this, I feel the sickness in the people, in their bodies. And right now, not far from me, is someone that has been in a nightmare. You were thrown into the medical system. And it's a series of unrelenting treatments, constant agony, going again and again and again, bouncing from one specialist to another, always filling out endless pieces of paper to figure out what is covered, what isn't covered, what will work, what won't work, until you feel like a guinea pig. You feel like you're being experimented on. It's awesomely terrible. Well, right now, the healing hand of Jesus is right here for you. Right now, the healing hand of Jesus is here for you. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel, and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.